Welcome to The Contrarians, where we are right and you are wrong. I'm Julio. And I'm Alex. Here on the show, we rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. For the first half of each episode, Contrarian's Corner, we trash the fresh red tomatoes and praise the rotten green splotches, making our case any way we can. The aptly titled Real Talk serves as the second half of each episode. This is where we discuss our true feelings on the movie we're covering. For more information on our podcast and to browse past episodes, you can head over to our website, wearethecontrarians.com. From there, you can also access our patron and merchandise, because capitalism. If you enjoy our attempts at comedic film discussions, we encourage you to subscribe and leave us a review on whatever podcatcher you use. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, that's what social media is for. You can find us on most platforms as at Contrarian Prime. You can also see what we look like if you go to youtube.com slash at Contrarian Prime, and you can contact us by email at wearethecontrarians at gmail.com. I think that covers it. Then it's time for the podcast. And we are recording for Contrarian's Corner for Judge Dredd. Not just Dredd, Judge Dredd, Alex. So this is the first one they did. Wasn't the other one just called Dredd? Mm-hmm. Just yeah. Dredd. Just Dredd. Okay. It's much cleaner. That had Olivia Thurlby, though. This does not. No, but this has But what it Diane does Lane. have is <laughs> Diane Lane and screenplay by Stephen E. DeSouza. Once again, Mr. DeSouza making his way to Contrarian's lore, just bulking up his already legendary status on this podcast. Yeah, I think um, this officially opens the Desusa wing in the Contrarian's Museum. I think so. I think that's fair because this followed up Street Fighter and uh, directed by Danny Cannon, who I'm going to be honest, not familiar with outside of this. Looks like he's uh, thrived in television. That's where he's done most of his work. He has done a few other films. Oh, he was uh, he directed Geostorm, which I have seen. In theaters. Yes. Uh, directed reshoots of Geostorm, I should correct there. And he was an executive producer on it. So there you go. Uh, this is Judge Dredd. We're welcoming Sly back to the fold. When's the last time we hung out with Sly? Oscar? Is it Oscar? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, Sylvester Stallone, Diane Lane, Rob Schneider, Max von Sydow, Armand Asante, James Remar showing up to hang out for a little bit, you know? The whole gang's here. It's a, it's a very 90s movie in the best possible way. It is. You get the 90s versions of these actors. This is Rob Schneider before the stick. Mm-hmm. This is Armin Asante when people still knew who Armin Asante was. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. Last you know, few times I've watched The Santa Claus, the Tim Allen Christmas classic, something that went over my head completely as a child that now I find to be one of the funniest parts in the movie is when uh, Scott Calvin has sent the, the the nice list, you know, and he's just going through it. He like rolls it out like a scroll and you can see him reading names and he goes, Armand Asante. So that's <laughs> what I think of now every time I see old Armand. I wouldn't call this a legendary bomb, but a pretty famous flop financially and critically i think we'll get to um why in the second half but to kick off here contrarian's corner this is judge dread starring sylvester stallone just stallone on the poster remember those days when we just had the last name of the actor uh based on judge dread the comic book character who looking into it today uh i didn't realize debuted in 1977 so you can take all your this rips off robocop or terminator things and maybe turn that around and think that Maybe those movies rip off Judge Dredd. Written by William Wisher Jr. and our boy Stephen DeSouza. This was released on June 30th of 1995 with a budget of approximately $90 million with a global box office return of $113 million. As I said, we'll circle back to that point in the second half. 22% of Rotten Tomatoes, Julio. This is not held in high regard. It's a shame, and I blame the nerds. And dare I say, if it was released today, it would be. Uh, it's it's tough, man, because I think that we've we've as much as I I hate the idea of superhero burnout, I do think that people have gotten now it's in their heads that now they distrust comic book movies, and so a well put together comic book movie that is not part of a universe, mm-hmm. I, I think it gets shafted today. So 
it doesn't matter if it has Stallone and Diane Lane in it. It, it would still be like, oh, it's just another comic book movie. And so people wouldn't give it the benefit of the doubt. I, it, what is your theory that this would be because it's not Marvel or DC, this would triumph today? Yeah, I guess I think it would do better in that sense of like, it's just something new. Because now people are just kind of programmed to go see comic book movies. And Man, didn't the crow just bomb? Well, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe it would do worse uh yeah. <laughs> you just made me realize that i was watching it and i was thinking man mid 90s stallone in an r-rated comic book movie i'm not sure this could have been more tone deaf for the time and then no maybe if it came out in 2024 it would be more tone deaf so still starting stallone <laughs> oh absolutely it's called old dread he's got to say uh i am the law <laughs> i am all right, 22% Julio. People are not fans of this. Roger Ebert gave it two out of four stars. What quotes did you pull for us to review? Man, I didn't find Ebert's. Now I'm, I'm blaming myself for not trying harder, but we're going to have to do with these he four said, uh, quotes. He said Stallone survives it, but his supporting cast, also including an uninvolved Joan Chen and a tremendously intense Jurgen Prochnow, isn't well used. So I'm assuming the first one is the the scientist that comes in towards the third act that gets the shot of like you should know who this is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, Jurgen is the bad guy from Beer Fest. So there you go. As always, Raj fighting for the little man here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand. It's also I, I would say not a movie made for Roger Ebert, and that's no. okay. <laughs> not nearly enough breasts. Yes. <laughs> um. All right, for lack of Roger Ebert, we'll do with Todd McCarthy from Variety, who says, A thunderous, unoriginal, futuristic hardware show for teenage boys. Um, well, sorry they missed the mark on the audience, because this originally was NC-17, and then they had to whittle it down to R, so those teenage boys are a lot of sneaking into theaters for this one, I suppose. What the hell? NC-17? Was there like a hardcore sex scene between uh, Dredd and Judge Hershey? Sly just took Diane Lane to Pound Town in the original cut of this. The the three and a half hour black and white cut. Uh, we'll circle back to that in the second half. All right. Uh, TV Guide says, isn't helped by Sylvester Stallone's embarrassingly awkward performance. Aw. Embarrassingly awkward. Did they not see Oscar? <laughs> so what's I, I look, I'll put it out here now. I'm not familiar with the Judge Dredd comics. Like I've seen like a couple of stories, I think, that I remember reading when I was a kid, but I'm not a follower uh, of the lore. And uh, I think that his performance works fine in the context of the movie. He's supposed to be this unemotional police officer. Emotionless, yeah, just kind of like killing machine. Yeah, he, he's just... He's supposed uh, to be a robot, but he's a human. Right, and so I think that he actually, <laughs> in that in that sense, Stallone is perfect casting. It's just he he doesn't have to flex the acting muscles that much. He's just he has just has to be himself. Next, Jonathan Rosenbaum from the Chicago Reader says, directed without inspiration by Danny Cannon from a stupid script by Michael DeLuca, William Wisher, and Steven D'Souza. Man, just going all in. <laughs> this guy was in a bad mood. Yeah. I don't think we've ever read a quote where somebody called the script or the movie stupid. Just like a stupid script. It's so um uninspired. Yes. And we're going to close with Eric Lurio from Greenwich Village Gazette, who says, Fa, Salai sucked. The comic book sucked worse. Jeez. <laughs> Can't please this guy with anything. Why did this guy go see a Judge Red movie? <laughs> I, my theory has always been that this was the, the backlash for this movie was from comic book purists who couldn't stand the idea of your standard action star, Sylvester Stallone being put in their precious comic book property as the lead and then add Rob Schneider, like insult to oh, injury. Oh, man. Yeah. That's that's always been my theory. But I could be wrong because especially like this quote, this guy doesn't even like the comics. <laughs> he didn't like the movie. So I don't know. Maybe He went maybe, and pissed off. Maybe, Alex, we have the, the luxury of being away enough from this movie's release where we can appreciate everything that he got right. I think that mm -hmm. that's what this... This episode is going to be like, I was saying like, you know what? You guys all overreacted. All right. Those are the quotes, Alex. Let's go to Contrarian's Corner. I knew you'd say that. 
<laughs> and then a very uh, wry smile from Stallone. Yes, he knows. He knows he's doing the thing. That he's like, this one's for you. I'm assuming that those that's a, a catchphrase from the comics. If it isn't, man, that must have pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Did you notice, Julio? This is like Marvel completely hijacked their studio signature from the opening of this movie. It was missing the, the Marvel anthem, though. Dun, 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 None of that. <laughs> I uh, I don't remember if it still does this, but I remember the first few Marvel films, the when that studio signature would hit, it would make like this really subtle sound of like pages flipping. It was like it still does. It's amazing. Okay. I love it. Yes, it gets me so excited. It's like a, a like Pavlov's dog. I start salivating. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to know where they got that from, it's from a uh, Danny Cannon's Judge Dredd of 1995. Man, kudos to them. That's that's good. It's it's kind of a shame and and surprising that it took so long for somebody to pick it up because this is brilliant. It's, my first note is, hey, comics. <laughs> That's <laughs> for anybody who walked into Judge Dredd not knowing that this was originally based on a comic book. There you go. This kind of prepares you for what follows. Like if you're like, what the hell, a giant robot? Well, yeah, it's comic books. <laughs> Nothing can prepare you for the original song that plays over the closing credits, though. So just keep that in mind. Okay, I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we start this with a voiceover. Julio, you want to take a stab at who did the voiceover? Is it Sam Jackson? It is not. Oh, it is James Earl Jones. Okay, okay. Different iconic black man. I was going to go with Morgan Freeman after, so. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but yeah, he, uh, James Earl Jones welcomes us to the party with a reading of, a, you know, we get the scrolling text explaining what's going on uh, in the third millennium. Things are bad and there's really no law. There's only the judges. Uh, by the 2080s, much of Earth has become an uninhabitable wasteland. We're speeding that up. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> while some humans manage to survive in the barren, cursed Earth, the majority of humanity remains in... Huge mega cities with populations of tens of millions to combat crime. The traditional justice system has been replaced by a core of judges whose role combines those of a police officer, judge, jury and executioner. And this is what brings us to the dance here. We see just one of these mega cities. We scroll through it. it feels uh, like Joel Schumacher made it because this is a lot like what his Gotham looks like in the Batman yep. films that he the had. Big statues. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> Statue of Liberty and just dead center surrounded by apartments and billboards and telling us to eat recycled food we see this through the the awe filled eyes of a young rob schneider which <laughs> was not what i would have picked as the audience surrogate in a movie like this but i got i think it works it throws you off in a good way i, I my very very limited knowledge of the judge Dredd comics is that they are not what you would call mainstream they are a little off center and so it makes perfect sense right that the, the regular guy is gonna be rob schneider um did you have trouble getting into the mindset that rob schneider was here with no funny makeup with no funny accent he's not making crazy faces he's just like a regular guy i i have a hard time adjusting to rob schneider in anything so yeah it was uh <laughs> It's a bit jarring, but he's still a name and that's part of like the opening here these opening credits man it's just like a a Rolodex of A-listers and they don't even have James Remar in the opening credits. He just shows up in the very beginning as like the leader of a gang. And I was like, fuck, yeah, it's Richard. <laughs> I didn't know who he played. <laughs> yeah, I heard you say James Remar. I was like, OK, I'm assuming he's a judge. And so I didn't recognize him because of the helmet. <laughs> no, he uh, he has like a goatee or like almost like a beard. He looks a lot like he does in uh, 48 hours is like the you know, slimy bad guy. Um. He's not long for this world, though. Him and Sly have it out, and he comes off the losing end. There's, I don't know why, but I had this note when they um, first go in the city where Rob Schneider's, you know, getting loaded up and lands on the ground. There's like this sound effect. I don't know if it's supposed to be an alarm or something or like a siren, but it sounds exactly like Colossus when you hit the superpower button in the X Men arcade game. It just kept going. <laughs> rat, rat. I was like, did they sample that Colossus sound drop for this? It's uh, Stallone working out. There's maybe two people listening to this that knows what the fuck I'm talking about. Oh, that's a shame. If that's the case, please write in with praise for that X-Men arcade because. 
all time. Yeah, we've had the pleasure of playing together side by side. That's right. Yeah. Uh, our judge, Dread, shows up. Our, our titular character, Sly, shows up and declares in his first line in the film, I am the law. <laughs> this block is under arrest. And then proceeds to um, not ask questions about firing his gun <laughs> off and just <laughs> killing people in cold blood. Uh, so this opening, though, this doesn't really pay off throughout the rest of the movie, which was kind of disappointing. Did you notice they like are using kind of made up words? Like one of them says, like, holy grud or something like that. Like it. Yeah. Not yeah, made they, up. They, but like, I guess the vocabulary will change over the next several decades and right, you know, centuries. Uh, um, Clock or orange thing where they just come up with their own terms and they are trusting the audience to figure it out, uh, which I did. Because honestly, I noticed and then I completely forgot that that's what was happening. So you're saying it stops happening throughout the movie? I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that segues well to the next point I have of the dialogue in this movie, Julio, is you know not your typical dialogue you would find in a major motion picture. It does resemble the type of dialogue you would read in a comic book, don't you say? Yes, which is Good. I mean, well, the entire scenario is obviously 20 years later, this feels a little closer to reality than it did probably in the mid 90s. But still, it's it's the idea of, uh, you, you know, this wild setup where society would give this much power to a handful of people. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am OK with if society has gotten to that point, then people have also gotten to the point where they speak differently from what we know as, as regular conversations. So, yes, it, it, it's a little uh, stagey. Would you say, Alex, like you've said of uh, the last couple of entries in the Halloween franchise, that Judge Dredd would work as a play? Because of oh, the, absolutely. the level of right. Like Stallone walks to center stage and goes, I am the law. <laughs> Like the spotlight on him. <laughs> um, but also, okay, that I am 99% sure that that is from the comic books. Like him saying, I, I am the law. Mm -hmm. It has to be because there's a there's a song, right? And I think the song is inspired by the comic books, not by the movie. By Anthrax? Yep. I am the law. The, law. the song is about the 2080 character Judge Dredd and includes references to many of the character's storylines up until 1987. Interesting. So this is before the movie, which means that it's from the comics. So so mm -hmm. that's them. You know, I am the law is <laughs> I knew you'd say that. Maybe not. But <laughs> I am the law is <laughs> definitely from the comics, which means that they were they were trying. They were doing it for yeah. for the readers. And, and yeah, I, I like the dialogue in the sense that. I, you can get away with that in a sci-fi movie when it's futuristic and it's like not quite our world. And that's that's good. If Judge Dredd was taking place in like 1998, and it was just Stallone was just a regular police officer with delusions of grandeur. Then maybe we would have a problem. But no, I I like the way they talk. I It, it felt appropriate. Shout out to Scott Ian of Anthrax. Always an interesting cat to listen to speak. All right. So in Mega City One, the year is 2139, Joseph Dredd, one of the most dedicated street judges, assists five year judge Barbara Hershey in ending a block war. Herman Fergie Ferguson, a hacker just released from prison, is caught in the firefight and hides inside a food dispensing robot. Dredd arrests Fergie for destruction of city property and sentences him to five years imprisonment. Rico, a former judge, escapes from prison and returns to Mega City One to reclaim his uniform and lawgiver gun. He also finds and reactivates a decommissioned ABC warrior combat robot, attuning it to himself. So uh, we already mentioned Rob Schneider. Fergie is his character in this. Uh, judge Hershey, though, is uh, Diane Lane, who a movie like Judge Dredd, the first thing I don't think of is Diane Lane when I think of a comic book style movie. Um, of course, she's in fucking Man of Steel, right? Yep. Sadly, that's that's where she that's where it all ended 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine from Judge Hershey, which is kind of an iconic character based on what I've gathered in this movie, to being the punchline of every Martha joke we've heard since uh, Dawn of Justice came out. That's a sad state of affairs for Diane Lane. I'm glad that. It's not like her career was just comic book movies. Thankfully, she branched out into other things. But uh, 
that's sad. Like, I, I wouldn't blame her if she doesn't want to come back for Judge Dredd 2. I do love Diane Lane a lot. I think she's a great actress, and she's obviously uh, quite a looker in this one in particular. Um, but it pains me that Judge Barbara Hershey was not played by Barbara Hershey, who was <laughs> would have still been in her 40s, I believe, when this movie was made. So just feels like a waste. I think that Barbara Hershey probably wouldn't. It would be harder to buy that Barbara Hershey OG would put up with Stallone's attitude here. Like Diane fair. Lane is very uh, much like Rob Schneider when he enters the mega city. Like Diane Lane is pretty wide eyed, and you can see that she respects Stallone probably a little too much. <laughs> she has a little bit of hero worship in that relationship. Uh, yeah, the, the original Barbara Hershey would just tell him to fuck off and walk away. She wouldn't even offer to represent him at his trial. Rico. Uh, our former judge who had been imprisoned here. This is, of course, Armand Asante. He's the bad guy. <laughs> During the course of this, it's revealed that Max von Sydow plays the chief justice. Fargo is his name. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> He's for whenever uh, whenever a demon starts stalking around Mega City. You know, he has his past with Pazuzu. So. <laughs> Through uh, the exposition about Rico, we learn that he was... Judge Dredd's only friend, Diane Lane asked, him, didn't you ever have a friend? He said, I did. One I said, what happened? He goes, I judged him. <laughs> so we know that there's some uh, tension here. And Armando Santi playing, you know, to the cheap seats. Talk about it being a play of the the bad guy, the maniacal laugh, the the evil facial expressions, mannerisms. And yeah, he uh, brings this robot back to life. And uh, we learn he was a judge because of this lawgiver gun. They're attuned to the DNA of judges only so we know there's some backstory and you know what's great about this movie julio it keeps it a tight 90 minutes so we don't take a fucking 70 minute side quest learning all of this backstory there's a few lines of dialogue pictures we just get right to the point i love it there's not a flashback there's not a 15 minute detour into when stallone arrested asante judged him there's no flashback to when stallone was genetically engineered by by the city i mean it's it's all like quick lines of dialogue and then the reactions of the actors and that's that's all that matters uh asante brings back the iron giant which is amazing <laughs> i was not expecting that uh it, it, it becomes a, a recurring character i thought it was gonna be just like a one-time thing but no it's like basically his right hand man his right hand robot um, and before i forget giving jaws the revenge a run for its money in that this robot, when it's gunning down judges and innocent people throughout the course of the movie, laughs. It's like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> uh, not, not to be, <laughs> not to be uh, outdone, of course, by Jaws roaring at the end of Jaws the Revenge. But it, uh, it definitely gave me flashbacks to that. This, the 90s, the beautiful 90s were... <laughs> Everything was possible in the world of cinema. So so you like Armando Asante as a bad guy? I mean, I think that once he's introduced and he kills a bunch of people and he has some quippy lines, you're like, all right, this is our bad guy for the duration. This is it. And it's not, compared to everybody else in the cast, he is kind of the, the smaller name. I mean, he's a great actor, but he is not, you know, today in a comic book movie, you would cast the villain with one of the bigger names. But mm -hmm. here they, they just give this guy a shot. They're like, all right. You were the guy that was Antonio Banderas' brother in The Kings of Mambo. I think your time to shine is is now. Did you did you like him? Uh, I thought he was good in this, yeah. In terms of just understanding the assignment, as the kids say. At no <laughs> point during this movie does he betray the tone of ridiculousness that, like, he, he starts ridiculous and all it does is intensify. Yeah, he has that awesome line of, uh, what is the meaning of life? It ends. And then he shoots somebody. <laughs> There's a great deal of tremendous one-liners like that. The way James Remar gets killed is he dreads explaining to him the crimes he committed. And he's like, first degree murder. And James <laughs> Remar goes, let me guess, life. And then Stallone shoots him in the head and goes, death. <laughs> With that voice, too. It's, it's emoting is for pussies. <laughs> Vartis Hammond. Played by uh, famed character actor Mitchell Ryan, uh, is a news reporter critical of Dread, and he is murdered. It appears to be Dread that barges in and guns him down, but of course he's wearing the helmet, so we're not not entirely sure. Because I think Sly's the good guy here. Just a just a hunch. Oh, but that guy was was asking too many questions. Come on. The whole system is the problem, not just Judge Dread. No. 
Dredd becomes the chief suspect. Dredd is taken to trial before a tribunal of counsel judges, including Griffin and Chief Justice Fargo. We mentioned uh, Max von Sydow previously. Griffin is Jurgen uh, Prochnow, who, I don't know, they cast uh, this kind of foreign European dude in this role of a, you know, one of the police officers. He might, uh, he seems like he could be a bad guy. You never know. It is the 90s after all. <laughs> They were trying to appease Roger Ebert. It's Ebert's boy. Let's put him there so we can get some cred. Um, delicious irony, social criticism, just the fact that nobody gets a trial except for the cops. That's right. <laughs> that's awesome. That's one of the uh, parties running for office. I think that's how they would have society run as well. So. Uh. <laughs> I do need to go ahead and call out because I've jokingly avoided it, but to ensure no one has an aneurysm listening to this, I understand that Jurgen Prochnow, his greatest known role is for <laughs> Das Boot. Uh, I'm aware of this, but he's always going to be the bad guy from Beer Fest to me. Uh, what was his name in that movie? Baron Wolfgang von Wolfhausen. <laughs> <laughs> so Wolfgang here is... Um, there's something not quite right about him. Uh, and Max von Sydow is Dredd's mentor, so he's very torn by this whole process. Uh, but Dredd is found guilty as his DNA is found on the bullets used to kill Hammond. A feature of the lawgiver is imprinting the user's DNA on each bullet, a fact apparently unknown to most judges. <laughs> to save Dredd, Fargo steps down as chief justice and at his last request asks the council to spare Dredd's life because he's initially sentenced to death. So instead, Dredd's sentenced to life imprisonment while Fargo embarks on, quote, the long walk, which Julio, I think we're going to circle back. You're going to have to explain that to me. This is in which a retired judge ventures into the cursed earth to bring law to the lawless. Judge Griffin, who freed Rico to frame Dredd for the murder, becomes chief justice and instructs Rico to cause chaos in the city. So we were right to think that Griffin was in on all this. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> Very quickly uh, exposed as the bad guy. I think we're maybe like 30 minutes in. Uh, the Long Walk, Alex, I I don't know, again, if this is comic book lore or if this is something that De Souza and his team came up with for the movie. But it is probably the the most fascinating aspect of this society, the idea that the law is not just the law, but it's some sort of religion. Because it seemed to be that once you retire as a judge – then you don't just go home and chill. Instead, you go out into the badlands with the the good book, which is not the Bible, but the, I guess the law. And you you preach the law to the lawless crowds out there. So instead of moving to Florida to like a condo, you basically become a Jehovah's Witness. Yes. Yeah, basically. And, and uh, Maximum Saito said, you know, that's a death sentence for me. <laughs> But but that's what happens to everybody, not just him, like anybody who retires and just goes on to do that. And that's the fact that the society in this movie has evolved to the point where the law is indistinguishable from religion. Now it's just that's what you do, right? Like you imagine if like the Pope retires and then he just goes to the desert <laughs> to bring the the word of god to whoever he runs into like that's that's kind of like what, what's happening here and so it really gives you an idea of how twisted the concept of law and, and lawlessness has become in this future it's it really explains why something in theory something should change i think that this movie was setting up a lot of uh arguments that would hopefully have been followed up in in sequels right because it's it's obviously too big of a problem too big of a concept to tackle in just one movie, but the, you know, this this idea that there's uh, that society has gotten rid of due process, and now you just have, I don't know, a hundred judges expediting <laughs> the, uh, the the trials in the street. Like you know, we're trusting their judgment, and then not just that, but we are trying to get this to spread all over the world. You know, there's no religion. There's no allusions to religion anywhere in the movie. This is it's just the law. The law is worship. Like Stallone lives by the law. And in the brief moments when somebody says, but what if the law is wrong? <laughs> you can see like his brain short circuiting, right? Like uh, he doesn't know how to respond. <laughs> uh, and that is, this is the ultimate knife twist in a way, right? Like if the law can't be wrong, then how come he has been wrongly imprisoned? <laughs> You're right. Like you can see he has like his brain has never like even come close to pondering this before. <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing it, it, because it's suddenly that's that's what his whole life has been about. And he has to reckon with 
with the fact that they got it wrong. And if they got it wrong with him, then is there a chance that he could have gotten it wrong with somebody? <laughs> you know, you spent 30 minutes painting him as this really confident character. And then you spend the rest of the movie kind of analyzing, looking for those micro reactions where he may have a crisis of faith. Stallone is a very stoic performer. So, of course, you have to look for them. But that's that's the reward. <laughs> Now, Judge Hershey, as a, as a lawyer, Alex, by the way, how how do you like that? Diane Lane, changing gears. I have in my notes, D- Diane Lane, single female lawyer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she presents a, an interesting, she's very compelling. And she, man, there's some world-class reaction acting here where she, you know, makes her case and then she's really proud of herself and has the look of like, mm-hmm. And then <laughs> the... Um, prosecution pulls out this unknown fact and she goes into utter despair immediately it's it's tremendous your honor i object we're not telling tales of recess here to say that diane lane's a good actress i I know we've joked about she ventured back into the cursed earth that is the comic book movie uh genre (laughs) but she's fucking diane lane so seeing her in this is funny to me and not like a like a point and laugh type of thing it's just very tickling I think of her like as a you know a real actress. She was married to Josh Brolin, et cetera, et cetera. And here she is in a ridiculous costume, arguing for Stallone to be spared. It's uh, it's great stuff, man. Dude, you can call it ridiculous. I call it really hot. <laughs> <laughs> if you had your pick, you would pick Diane Lane to be your defense attorney. Oh man. Not in this society. Uh, I'm nothing against Diane Lane, but I think that the odds are stacked against women overall in the Judge Dredd world. Even earlier in the movie. You're an immigrant, Julio. You'd be fucked anyway. They wouldn't. They, the deliberation would be 90 seconds. That is true. But even then, man, who would I pick? I would pick the kid that that's a, a tech whiz in this movie. The guy that the kid that figures out that that video is like really shitty quality, so they really shouldn't allow it as evidence. <laughs> Julio, are you referring to the child that uh, Judge Hershey calls a putz? We have a, a script that was written in the 1990s that had Diane Lane calling someone a putz. Is that who you're referring to? Yes, because it comes back, Alex. It's like uh, our vernacular is circular. Words come out of fashion and then come back into fashion in the future. <laughs> Uh, what I was going to say, though, is that there's no respect for Diane Lane in this movie uh, because she has trouble even pulling off a regular traffic violation uh, oh that dickhead with like you know whatever the modern equivalent of the sports car was you got three counts of driving under the influence hey, you better listen i suggest you walk away and bother somebody else when i said i have powerful friends i mean powerful who is that guy is that guy like a name was that the the it's a very strange scene because it does stick out as like okay we're we supposed to know this guy yeah um see uh, the dane cook of the of the night <laughs> jesus he's driving the cyber truck of you know 20 yes <laughs> what is it 2130 or wherever we are 2139 yeah yeah it's it's the joke wasn't the guy the guy the joke was the the vehicle mm-hmm. yeah i get it yeah but it, it's like he seems unfazed by the fact that he's been pulled over by this female officer with a gigantic gun. But as soon as Stallone shows up, that's when he starts trying to uh, be respectful. So, yeah, no, sorry, Diane Lane. I, I love you as an actress. I think you look great as a judge. And I do believe that you would be able to to hold your own in a firefight. But as a defense attorney, I think that will be better off with somebody that the court would respect. <laughs> so, no, so, sorry. Dredd is taken to the Aspen Penal Colony by Air Shuttle, where he is seated next to Herman. This is Fergie, uh, Rob Schneider. However, the Angel Gang, a family of cannibalistic scavengers and bandits, shoot down the shuttle and bring Dredd and Herman back to their cave. A squad of judges investigate the crashed ship and infiltrate the cave, intent on killing any survivors on Griffin's orders. Fargo arrives in time to save Dredd's life, but Mean Machine Angel mortally wounds him. A dying Fargo reveals that Dredd and Rico are the result of the Janus Project, an experiment in genetic engineering intended to create the perfect judge. Dredd deduces Rico framed him for the reporter's murder using the identical DNA. Believing Griffin is trying to reactivate the Janus Project, Fargo urges Dredd to stop him. So, a couple things to unpack here. Most pressing, we get Rob Schneider doing a Sylvester Stallone impression, and it is wonderful. Yes. He sits next to him and he sees him and he, as any human in the 1970s, 80s or 90s could do, identifies Sylvester Stallone strictly on his jaw and chin <laughs> and says, it's. I forget how he 
breaches it, but he says, Mr. I am the law. And he does like the really <laughs> over the top Stallone impression. It's fantastic. This moment alone justifies Rob Schneider. You know, he's a bit of an idiot and he's one of those people that would benefit greatly in 2024 from just shutting up. <laughs> but uh, he's very funny here. He is. He's funny. And he makes a point that I, I made a little bit ago. He is the one that tells Stallone, hey, if the law is never wrong, how come you're here? And Stallone yes. has no answer. It's amazing. It's it's, it's His wonderful. hair starts smoking. Yeah. Uh, this is also where I think the movie sadly loses all the comic book fans because, oh, my God, they took his helmet off. They took his costume. Now he looks just like regular Sly. And I don't have a problem with that. Honestly, I paid my ticket to see Sylvester Stallone, not to see some rando in, in a costume. <laughs> he looks great in the costume. Don't get me wrong. He literally in the first you know half of the movie before he is stripped from his from his command, he looks like he just stepped out of a comic book. It's mm -hmm. it's really like I said, it's perfect casting. And I mean, the costume design obviously does a lot of the work there too. But uh, he's imposing. He looks great. But this is a Judge Dredd movie, so it should be a story that takes in places that maybe we haven't seen before. And so I was perfectly okay with him not having the helmet anymore. We already did that. We we saw that. Now let's let's have him be. Uh, more exposed, more vulnerable. And what is more vulnerable than being on a flight sitting right next to Rob Schneider? <laughs> uh, Alex, is your next note that the the leader of the cannibals could have been played by Randy Quaid? No, my note is uh, we're in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 layer here. Like the, <laughs> the end of that movie is all of a sudden we're, we're there again. Uh, but I didn't even think about that. Yes, he could have been. Yeah, these guys, it's, it's pretty. Is, is this part of the R rating? Would they have gotten away with this if it wasn't radar the human rotisserie that we see in one Dude, shot yeah there's a, a human body on a spit roasting over an open flame it's kind of shocking not gonna yeah. lie <laughs> and rob schneider does a good job of accurately reflecting the terror that would instill in a human being <laughs> go check out our ravenous episode to hear us talk about the uh thoughts and you know opinions we've had on eating people over the course of our life <laughs> makes it sound so disturbing <laughs> it's just your average conversation about what it would be like to eat people on video yeah, i mean that's where the movie ravenous takes us places and that's one of them no uh no this is just like a quick shot of, of a dude of a person spinning over flame and uh it looks like that is, that's what they're gonna do to rob schneider and and dread and this is also something that I don't know if it's lifted from the comics, but it feels like they could have been part of the comic book mythology. Did you feel that these guys, these opponents, were maybe characters from the from the comics? Because they have names, they have a, a kind of a, a mythology, it seems like. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can see that. And it's, um, you know, in a time like that, that's, I think we, uh, we kid ourselves of how many people would adjust to a lifestyle like that if uh, times came for it. So, uh, and then Max von Sydow comes in fucking cloaked and you don't know who it is it just looks like an action hero and then he takes the hood off and you realize it is an action hero it's max von Sydow. and then he gets impaled and mortally wounded as i referenced a minute ago and then yeah, he, basically, laughs. <laughs> he basically does the liquid snake exposition for metal gear solid where he talks about the la Inf infant experiment that bred two perfect genetic soldiers it's so great because the lies like told me i had a family he's like i lied to you and then Stallone goes, don't die. And then Von Sydow goes, ah, and dies. <laughs> uh, what I love the most about this scene is that, I mean, it goes on for a little bit. It's it's a big uh, emotional moment for Von Sydow, for Stallone. And it's just close-ups of the two of them. And, and then Von Sydow dies. And then we finally cut to the wide shot. And it turns out that Rob Schneider was sitting in the corner <laughs> the entire time. Yeah. Just watching this very intimate exchange between these two people. <laughs> it, to his credit, he stayed quiet the entire time. Because mm -hmm. before this and after, he's just nonstop. He's a motor mouth, you know, in typical Rob Schneider fashion. But here he had enough sense to be respectful <laughs> and, and just zip it while Max von Sydow died. And he goes, what do we do now? Which is understandable, the sense of urgency needed there. What's Stallone's uh, response? We go hunting. I don't know what he says. <laughs> <laughs> and so we mentioned the robot guns down a bunch of the uh, judges. And yeah, Rico is well on his way to taking over here. The escape to get back into the city is with Sly and 
Rob Schneider, he explains there's like an exhaust that flares up. It burns out every uh, 30 seconds so we can run to the exhaust line to get back in. Uh, someone did this before and Schneider goes, oh, so the guy lived to tell about it. He goes, no, he got roasted, but the theory sound. <laughs> and he <laughs> has just this great like it's the up until that point the most stallone's like tone elevates it's very funny and as you can imagine comedy abounds as uh schneider trips and falls as they're going through the exhaust but they they end up making it don't they julio they do and it's a uh, very i mean i'm not gonna say understated because i think we actually go into slow-mo and there's close-ups and everything but still it, it, the movie doesn't slow down to explain it the fact that stallone goes back for him he doesn't need him he could have just let him die but mm -hmm. schneider trips and stallone has that moment where he's like uh do i keep going or do i go back for him and he goes back for him and that is a huge thing because in stallone's mind the way that it's uh programmed in a way right like he's a he's a criminal schneider's a criminal and he deserves to die because that's just the way that things work in this society but mm -hmm. the fact that he goes to save this man's life, I think it shows just a marked change in the way that he started perceiving the world. That's amazing. <laughs> and the movie never stops to give him a speech where he realize, you know, he explains to you what he has learned or anything. It's just, all right, here we go. Let's keep going. Subtlety, Julio, because we don't need to add 30 minutes onto the movie to explain the emotions he's going through and whatnot. I mean, when you have an actor like Sylvester Stallone, you can afford to be subtle in your That's movie. That's very, very fair. The law can't apologize. That's just it. You're not the law anymore. In Mega City 1, Rico terrorizes the city and assassinates judges in various ways. Chief Justice Griffin, intent on creating an army of judges from his own DNA, uses the situation to convince council judges to unlock the Janus file. After the council judges unlock the file, Griffin has them killed. Dredd and Fergie sneak back into the city and meet with Hershey, who has discovered the Janus project independently. They go to the Statue of Liberty, under which Janus laboratories are hidden. They encounter the ABC warrior, this is the robot, uh, who wounds Fergie and captures Dredd and Hershey. Rico uses his own DNA as the template for the Janus clones, then commands the ABC warrior to kill Griffin. Despite his wound, Fergie disables the ABC warrior and Dredd fights Rico while Hershey fights his assistant, Dr. Isla Hayden, is her name? So here we have a lot to unpack, obviously. Uh, did you uh, did you catch did you catch Alex how many judges were killed in this <laughs> transition to the third act? <laughs> they a actually lot. say it. Ninety six. Of course. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's a it's, it's the order sixty six moment of the Judge Dredd universe. I think Lucas <laughs> just ripped that off a few years later. <laughs> so we get back. Uh, they can speed up this process the way they try to sell the Janus project is we can make people in eight hours they're going to make humans and um, during a chase with the judges and Schneider and Stallone we get a poop joke in which Rob Schneider insinuates that he shits his pants and Stallone responds <laughs> we're going and we also get a very 90s sex joke I think it's earlier when uh, they're sneaking in Stallone knocks out a, a judge a fellow judge and then he he goes for his clothes, I'm assuming so he can dress up as a judge again. And Schneider is like, why are you going for his pants? And then he says, we don't have time for this. <laughs> Implying that Stallone was going to blow the guy. I don't know. But it was, um, Did not catch that. It was very on brand. <laughs> I, I didn't resent it, but I also fully acknowledge that that's the kind of joke that we, we don't allow anymore. Mentioned here, Rico has lost it completely. And... Uh, wants his DNA to be cloned. So the Janus project is going to be just making, you know, clones of Rico, the ultimate killing machine, the ultimate criminal, or however they word it. The Asante project. And this is before he orders the robot to kill uh, Sly and the gang. We get the Armand Asante best supporting actor clip talking about he stood for life, not the law. And yes. this is where Stallone gets a... Uh, I think his most famous line from this movie where he goes, you betrayed the law <laughs> and Armand makes some good points of like, yeah, well, you did this. I was accomplishing this and delivers his lines with such conviction and gusto that this is I, I definitely penned this as the Oscar clip that he has. Dude, he makes the best points. He makes the points that I think the movie's actually making. <laughs> this is, he's criticizing the society as it is. <laughs> <laughs> the law shouldn't be, you know, it's like what the law says and then what is right. And sometimes you need to adapt the law so that it 
it actually meets with what is morally right. And that was uh, that is a very elevated discussion in an action movie that's actually in its final 30 minutes. It's <laughs> it's pretty impressive, uh, especially because Assad is still playing the stereotypical uh, and not in a bad way, right? Uh, 90s bad guy. So he's being very mm-hmm. flamboyant and very, very out there, but he's still piercing through <laughs> Stallone's confidence as if Rob Schneider hadn't fucked with him enough. <laughs> it, it's, it's still like Assad that keeps going like, this is a joke. You need to change. Um, also, I think worth mentioning, Alex, is that uh, Diane Lane, got a side quest while Sly was out in the desert. And so she's been doing investigating of her own, as you mentioned and on that summary. And uh, I guess it's it's satisfying in the sense that it kept Diane Lane in the movie, right? It's, it's kind of funny, kind of showing again that there is not much use for women in this world because she arrives at a conclusion that Stallone gets to also. <laughs> like when they meet together, she's like, yeah. I, I, I discovered all this. And Stallone's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> You're just a woman. What do you think? <laughs> uh, speaking of that, she literally they, they get into a cat fight with the the female doctor and Diane Lane. And I have in my notes cat fight. And if I was Joey Styles, I would be screaming cat fight because uh, they just you know they're pulling hair and punching each other. And uh, the doctor calls um, Diane Lane a bitch, and then <laughs> Diane Lane says it's judge bitch, and then head buzzer. <laughs> that's that's where they started, and then they worked backwards. <laughs> <laughs> to get to that point, they're like, well, obviously we need a female villain so we can have this scene play. So, all right, let's introduce this. The, you're right. The line Judge Bitch was written, and then that was like the starting point. That's, uh, you know, 94 probably is when this was being, that uh, William Washer and DeSouza were working on it. Just picture a chalkboard or a blackboard, and it just says <laughs> Judge Bitch, and like, you know, it has a circle around it. And they're like, all right, we got to work back from this. <laughs> It can't be Asante punching her. So and when they finally got Diane Lane for the role, they're like, "She's gonna say it. So it's better than I could have ever imagined." <laughs> Stallone is like, "I thought I got to say Judge Bitch." <laughs> we originally thought Madonna was gonna have the role. Uh, so I laughed way too hard at this. The the you know, like MacGruber. Uh, have you you've never seen the MacGruber movie? Have you? Nope, I've seen the trailer. Okay, MacGruber's incredible, but the one of the jokes in that is the way MacGruber kills everybody is he rips their throat out. Like, that's his like, go-to move, and that's obviously very ridiculous and over the top. But my f- favorite thing about Rico in this is his, like, you know, his bodyguard, the robot, the go-to is he orders him to rip their arms and legs off. He does it multiple <laughs> times, and he's just like, rip their arms and legs off. Save the head for last. And it's just, that's very uh, medieval, obviously, but uh, it's just kind of funny how specific it is. Is that what happens to Griffin? I just realized I don't remember how Griffin yeah. dies. Okay. Well, we don't see it. We see just blood splattering on the robot's feet. But yeah, that's uh, how he met his maker. <laughs> that's where the filmmakers uh, got a little shy. Or, or is that what was getting the Nancy 17? So I'm like, all right, <laughs> off screen. We'll circle back. Put a pin in it. <laughs> Rico activates the clones prematurely, but they fail to stop dread. Uh, they're like underdeveloped clones they're basically monsters like at this point and uh dread fortunately just blows them all up before they can hatch out of their their little eggs there it's like uh you know the the creators or the architects and prometheus trying to get out but sly says "Uh -uh." (laughs) it's more of a it's like the scene in alien resurrection with all the sigourney weavers it's all the asantes they're like (laughs) half-baked The premature clone activation results in the destruction of the Janus Laboratory. Yeah, everything blows up. Dread pursues Rico to the top of the Statue of Liberty, which we have not done the first X-Men movie. So I was trying to think if we've done any other movies that end up in a battle on the Statue of Liberty. Having um, the Ghostbusters 2, which is not quite what you're saying, but still. Yeah, good point. Good point. Point taken. Uh, and the final struggle sees Rico. He gets the Hans Gruber death, dude. He gets thrown <laughs> off, and we see in slow motion him falling. Difference being, he's falling head first with like that, the, you know, the arms circular motion, uh, as opposed to, you know, Hans Gruber, Alan Rickman. We saw his, his eyes, and he reached up for one last uh, attempt at saving himself. But anyway, uh, Rico meets his maker here, and it's Judge Dredd. I am the law! Having recorded the entire event, Central, this is like the computer system that runs the city, uh, the city's controlling supercomputer broadcasts the information, clearing Dredd's name. 
The remaining judges ask Dredd to become the new chief justice, but he refuses, preferring to remain a street judge. Uh, and this is this ending. Like, help me fill in the blank, Julio. It used to be B E T T E R. <laughs> he comes out. So romantic. He gets his uniform back. He hasn't put his helmet on yet, though. And they ask him, he's like, no, I'm the law. I'm going to go back to the street. <laughs> and he goes to get on his bike. And Diane Lane's like, you know, you still owe me one. And he's, I think he like barely smiles. And then he goes to put his helmet on and she takes it off and then she kisses him. And then we have the big kiss, the crescendo, the big romantic moment. And then that's, he has this look on his face, like, like he's feeling emotion for like, it's the Grinch <laughs> with his heart beating, you know, and growing three sizes. And is this the first time in his entire life that Judge Dredd has gotten an erection? I think so. I think it's safe to say because he does. He looks at her and then he like looks off to the side a few times. Like he's like, <laughs> "What's going on here?" And so as he's processing these emotions, Lane says to him, uh, "Judge Hershey, feels good to be human, don't you think?" And then the, he hits her with, "I knew you'd say that." And with just a raging fucking hard on, Sly pulls away <laughs> on his motorcycle, and all the townspeople and judges are clapping and cheering for him. It's just like, "Way to go!" You know, the end of. Uh, Observer report where the guy's like, way to go, Ronnie. But it's just everyone in the city doing that. And he rides off uh, into the sunset. Quite literally, he goes out on like a pier as the sun setting or like a, a bridge. And he looks over the city that he is the judge, jury and executioner of. And then we cut to the credits. And if you had been caught off guard by anything in this movie so far, it does not prepare you for how off guard you will be caught by the cure playing something called the dread song, which is a song they wrote for judge dread over the closing credits. Cause when I think, you know, barren wasteland violence, post-apocalyptic future, I think of the cure. You better believe. I think of the cure all the time. So really it's more about <laughs> It's been a while since I've heard a Cure song in a movie, so it was like, "What the fuck? What happened?" That's not. I mean, what were you expecting for for this? Like, do you have a band in mind? Like some sort Dude, of. Dude, they should have just played the Anthrax song. I am the law. Two on the nose. Come on. <laughs> but still, like, <laughs> they're better than this. Who, imagine like the record label that had to like pitch this to Robert Smith, like you know. And now, like, I'm thinking like. Did he see like, you know, the dailies? Was he did he see like a rough cut of this to make sure the song hit the right tone? It's just it's very jarring. I think that Robert Smith is a fan of the comic book. That has to be it. And I'm like, sure, let's do it. How could this go wrong anyway? Uh, also, I want to call out Alex before we move on that uh, Rob Schneider gets gets to play a big part in the climax. It's not he mm -hmm. wasn't just comic relief. I in true. He, stops, he fashion, disables the robot. Yeah, because he's he, the hacker. Exactly. He gets to play a role. Everybody gets to play a role. Like it's it's that thing that you don't see in movies anymore, but where everybody has their their moment to shine at the end. So Schneider takes on the robot. Diane Lane takes on the fairly recently introduced female villain. <laughs> and Stallone takes on Enrico. Enrico, of course, kills Griffin. So it's it's just all it's a puzzle that fits together perfectly. I was very happy Schneider gets one last line also at the end. Doesn't he say that he would be a better kisser? He stops to watch it happen. He's like, oh, great. He gets all the credit. I help, too. And then he's like, and I guarantee I'm a better kisser than him. Yeah. And then he, like, remembers he's wounded. And he's like, all right, come on. Can we get out of here? Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful stuff. And a hell of a social commentary. Uh, I was one of my early notes was like, this is Robocop if Robocop was fun. Right? Robocop <laughs> takes it's, – it's so over the top. And it's also kind of criticizing society for the same thing. It's like, how much power are we giving the law? And, you know, is it a good idea to to expedite certain things when it comes to to how we treat criminals or potential mm -hmm. criminals but it takes itself a little too seriously here no they're mostly about having fun mostly about getting to the set pieces and then along the way we'll drop a few breadcrumbs that are i think supposed to lead into a movie that's that's bigger than this right mm -hmm. i think another huge statement is that stallone refuses that promotion at the end Mm -hmm. Why is he refusing? He's refusing because he's in denial of, uh, you know, everything that he's learned throughout the movie. He's like, I need time to process this. I can't become the new uh, Max von Sydow. <laughs> or is he refusing it because he thinks that the system is corrupt and maybe he can do more good being a street judge and he can he can affect change maybe from the streets instead of getting caught up in the bureaucracy. I don't know, but I, I think that that's something that could be answered in a, in a follow-up movie. I can tell you this, the Dread movie that we got, you know, however many years later with uh, Carl Orban as Dread, my recollection is that that doesn't deal with any of these issues. That was just like a straight up 
action movie. And mm. yeah, he doesn't take the helmet off ever in that movie, but he also doesn't have to reckon with the fact that maybe his origin story is not the only lie in his life, but also <laughs> the, the values that, that he lives by, the, the moral code that he has. Maybe it's also a little skewed. That doesn't happen in that movie, but in this one it does. And I think that that makes this one the superior uh, Dread adaptation. Having not seen the Carl Urban one, I can already uh, agree with you because this is uh, pretty fantastic. All right. Well, that's it for Contreras Corner. Alex, are you ready for real talk? I knew you'd say that. <laughs> Never say it's over. Never say the end. Every time you start, start to start the show. Never say give up.